Does this sound like a familiar scenario to you? You've been working away on your new design, maybe it's an animatronic mechanism or some housing for electronics or an articulated dragon. You finally print it out and, oh, it doesn't fit. Maybe the movement is crunchy, maybe that bit didn't print right and that overhang failed and that part's too loose. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make sure your prints work first time, every time. And to demonstrate, I'm going to design this print in place gearbox and hand fan put into use all of the techniques that I'm going to talk about. Probably the most important thing to understand is that while 3D printers get better and better every year, they can't achieve the kinds of accuracy and tolerances you get with something like machining. We're not precisely milling a face to microns of accuracy, we're building a tower of spaghetti. And there's always some possibility for the spaghetti, the extrusion, to expand or shrink, to squish slightly more or slightly less on one side or another. So what's the simple solution? leave a gap of 0.2 millimeters between every interacting face. I'll be honest, I default to this number all the time. It's a great starting point. That's the simple answer that will save you tons of spools of filament, but the long answer requires you to take a step further and try to visualize how your part will be printed while you're designing it. In my experience, features and fits printed parallel to the bed are always the most accurate and the strongest so you can usually leave the smallest gaps for parts you want to print in this orientation. Parts printed perpendicular to the bed are less accurate because now you have the influence of layer lines which will always have some variability and with any sort of overhanging feature there becomes the potential for a drooping surface which will mean you need a larger gap. There are cases where I might also leave a much bigger gap for something like a big overhanging surface or parts which move against each other. If you can anticipate that a feature will be difficult to print accurately, then make it so it's not critical to the part's function. In my head, I have like a sliding scale of how difficult a part will be to print. On the low end, if I want a snug fit on a very easy to print part, like a ship sorter, you can probably go all the way down to like 0.075 millimeters gap. For some really awkward feature, like a big overhang, I'll go up to maybe like 0.4 millimeters, and maybe a maximum of 0.5 if the two parts are going to be moving past each other often. So here's the propeller on the end of my gearbox. To attach to the gearbox, it's just a simple hexagon shape with each face of the socket being a 0.1 millimeter offset from the plug side. And I chose to go down to 0.1 rather than the 0.2 rule of thumb because I knew that I could print this parallel to the bed and I wanted it to be pretty tight. One surefire way to have 3D prints that fail is if your designs never actually make it to the printer in the first place. This can happen for a variety of different reasons, lack of inspiration, social media addiction, hangover, but one way you can protect your devices and data so you can keep working on your designs is with a virtual private network like the one provided by today's video partner, NordVPN. I like to work away from my desk quite often. I sometimes take my iPad to cafes or public areas to work on designs, but when you're out and about, there's always the possibility you could be the victim of a man in the middle attack, where the free public Wi-Fi at the cafe you're in is actually a fake network set up by criminals to harvest any sensitive data you enter. Using the link nordvpn.com forward slash Will Cogley, I can easily encrypt all of my online traffic and I don't have to worry about it anymore. With NordVPN, not only do you get protection from these kinds of attacks, but with Threat Protection Pro, you get advanced protection from malware, phishing, scams, and other online threats. Nord's Threat Protection Pro doesn't actually even need an active VPN to work, so you can just enable it in the app for Mac or Windows and not have to worry about attackers. If you use my link, nordvpn.com forward slash Will Cogley, you'll get an exclusive creator deal, a two year plan with four bonus months on top and it's all backed by Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. In case you missed it, head to nordvpn.com forward slash Will Cogley for an exclusive NordVPN deal and four bonus months. Plus it's risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. As it turns out, we're not always just assembling by slotting parts into each other parallel and perpendicular like shape sorter. Sometimes we have an overhang or a complex surface that two parts interact against. Modern 3D printers can cope with really shallow overhangs without support these days, but it always used to be a rule to keep every overhang angle to 45 degrees or less. And I actually still try to stick to that because it does seem to be the threshold at which the accuracy begins to go down a lot. Being able to print material with an overhang is a really important feature of additive manufacturing that opens the door to some real innovations because it allows us to make self-enclosed mechanisms and parts like herringbone gears which can't be manufactured in any other way. But that's one for the advanced section later. Using simple overhangs, I made some of the structure of the housing and this thread on the output side of the gearbox. If you design the teeth of your thread to have no more than 45 degrees overhang, 
and you leave a sensible gap between the faces, you can get a functional and reliable screw thread with 3D printing. I also like to round the sharp edges of the thread because otherwise we might get quite a thin and grainy edge which wouldn't be ideal for printing. In terms of the gap, I decided to leave between the faces of the threads, I went with 0.25 millimeters. It's a little more than it really needs, but I knew that the threads would bottom out and be tight at the end, so really that extra little bit of wiggle room doesn't hurt the function of the part. Printing with overhangs also allowed me to use helical gears in my design. If I had to support underneath the teeth as they printed, they would never print well enough to mesh nicely, but since the angle on these gears is only 30 degrees, they print great and that helical shape gives me a little bit of extra engagement on the teeth, which is pretty nice. And it also looks cooler than straight gears, which is important. Now it might surprise you to know that I don't really use any other filaments than PLA. I think this will be a controversial opinion, but I think that unless the conditions are perfect in terms of calibration, tuning and filament quality, PLA is generally going to be the best option on balance. It's not the strongest material, but honestly, I don't think that strength is that relevant when compared to layer adhesion and dimensional accuracy. Obviously, it depends on your design, but in most cases, the layers will separate and cause failure long before the part breaks otherwise, and in that regard, PLA is pretty hard to beat. Add in that it shrinks less, warps and lifts less, and is generally just well-behaved and non-toxic, I rarely use anything else, but if I do, it will be for simple parts with a high infill, and I'll go with PETG because it's also pretty easy to print with, ASA if I'm feeling fancy, although it is much more of a pain. What I will say is that there's actually a lot of variation between different types of PLA. Brands and even colours can make a surprising difference. I feel that it's similar to disposable vapes. Maybe we know a fair bit about the base chemical, propene glycol or PLA, but manufacturers have tried putting in every kind of additive imaginable, and that means that maybe we don't really know as much as we like to think we do about how the material really behaves. In my experience, matte PLA looks really nice, but tends to be weaker overall, and it seems to plastically deform easily rather than breaking out right. It's kind of chewy, in other words and the supports do seem to be particularly easy to remove. Silk PLA is usually super brittle and breaks really easily, so I tend to use it only for aesthetic purposes. I think that PLA Plus means something different to different manufacturers, and so unfortunately there is some trial and error in finding one you like. I quite like eSun's PLA Plus for tough prototypes, and then with regular PLA, some of it's amazing, some of it's horrible. Usually you get what you pay for. I tend to like Bamboo Lab Filament and eSun, but there are lots of good options. I will say, and this really is getting into bro science now, I think that dark filaments always print worse. And I think it's either because the extra pigment prevents the layers from being able to adhere nicely, or maybe because the darker colour absorbs more heat than it should. I don't have any evidence for this, it's purely anecdotal. For this design, I chose matte filaments because one, I just like the look and I don't have a specific application in mind, but also because I knew that I'd need some ports between the gears to space them out and I wanted to be sure I could separate them easily and as I mentioned, matte filament supports tend to break away really easily. Now to finish off my gearbox mechanism, I want to talk about the design principles of print in place or self-contained mechanisms. Now even though I left this part to last, you can see that it's pretty integral to how the design functions. Each gear is suspended in place by a bulge on the axle, which I can print by using 45 degree overhangs and underhangs like we talked about earlier. The only awkward part of that is that we need the input and the output to actually breach the housing. So if we wanted to make this print in place, the axle can actually go all the way through. So the axle stops short here and the gear itself has the same kind of bulge feature to hold it inside the housing. On the top side, we can terminate the shaft and bore with a 45 degree cone, so no supports needed, but on the opposite side, it's a bit trickier because we want that axle to start in midair and then connect to the housing at the top. For that, I knew I'd need some kind of internal support. One option would be to design my own little column that would sit in there with a small unsupported gap, but I'm familiar enough with the way that supports are generated to know that I can get away with leaving a small shelf on the bottom of the pin and a floor on the bottom of the housing, and a tiny support would generate and then easily break off once the gears are turning. This is actually a pretty simple application, but there are more complex ways you can apply this thinking. In my most recent version of my bionic hand, I came up with a finger design that prints a pretty complex series of linkages in position, and by putting a lot of thought into their arrangement, I was able to do it in a way that needed almost no supports. 
Notice that the axis of my pivots in this design are actually perpendicular to the bed, which I can get away with because these cones are formed with steep overhangs. It's even possible to break this boxy right angle thinking with pivots on all sorts of weird axes. Although it's not strictly print in place, I used similar kinds of cone shaped pivots along the curved complex palm of my hand. And as long as you keep in mind how the part will be printed in which orientation and what parts need to be precise versus which can withstand the lack of accuracy that comes from supports or shallow overhangs, your designs will work. So I think that the main takeaway you should get from this, besides the tips and tricks and rules of thumb, is that probably the most important factor to keep in mind as you design is how the part will be manufactured and assembled. There's a huge problem in engineering where designers and machinists or technicians don't talk to each other enough and it leads to this disconnect where we as designers sort of assume we know better than the person who has to build our designs. A design is only as good as it is manufacturable. If you come up with the perfect design, but it requires an impossibly tight tolerance or an unrealistically well-tuned printer, then it's not really a perfect design. Incidentally, due to the title of this video, the gearbox did work first time, but normally I do make a lot of silly mistakes and it's actually quite unrealistic to assume you can design anything perfect first time. Engineering is really the process of optimization and refinement through testing and prototyping. And where possible, I do think it's better to allow yourself to fail fast and make mistakes because that way you usually learn faster. This is Will from the Edison Room with a quick reminder that you can buy the parts for super realistic eye mechanisms, including highly realistic animatronic compatible eyeballs and PCBs for controlling your eye mechanisms on nmrobots.com. You can also get access to all of my CAD files for any of my projects on Patreon or through YouTube memberships. And I forget to mention it sometimes, but I have a Discord server where we discuss projects. Links for everything in the description. Big thank you to all of my supporters, and I'll see you guys in the next one.